Please be seated. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for being our refuge. Our refuge from the wrath of God, your Father. Holy, righteous wrath. That we can flee to you and cling to you by faith and be safe is amazing. And we worship you. Would you please grow our affections for you, that you would do this for us. Show us more and more, even today, how you are our refuge and our rock. And Father, we ask now that as we, in our worship, turn towards your word, would you please bless this time, bless the time that we have here where we're, your Bible is open, bless what I say, bless what we hear, so that we might know you, so that we might understand your gospel better, so that we might be a sharper instrument in your hand in this world, that our love for you might grow, that our worship of you would deepen, and that our fight against sin would become more effective. We need you greatly. Draw near to us, Lord, as we now draw near to you, and we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. Let's take our Bibles and let's open them up to Romans chapter 3, verse 27. Lord willing, we'll finish chapter 3 today, three down out of 16. We're making our way through the book of Romans, bit by bit, section by section, and I just love how Paul, in this letter, thinks. His thinking about the gospel is, comes out here. I love how Paul thinks as he unfolds the gospel in this letter to the Romans. This is how a Christian should be thinking about the gospel. Remember, Romans provides for us, indeed, the, the content of the gospel and what depth and what beauty and what riches there are in the gospel of Jesus Christ in this letter of, from Paul to the Romans. But Romans also, very importantly, we've talked about this before, it provides for us how the gospel should be laid out. You know this because we've talked about this. The gospel in Romans begins with the very, very bad, bad, bad news about us. And that's the place to start with anyone that you're sharing the gospel with. And if you get into a conversation with somebody and it's not started there, you're in your mind thinking like Paul does in Romans, you're thinking, I have to get to the bad news, Lord. Somehow help me get there sooner than later. Because unless you come into silent agreement with the bad news about yourself, in Romans, in the gospel, you'll see no need for grace. You'll see no need for faith in Jesus. So the contents of the gospel are being unfolded in Romans, to be sure, but also Paul is showing us how to unfold the gospel in the lives of others. And our passage today is actually another really important example of that. Paul has just detailed in verses 21 to 26 of chapter 3 the amazing truth of justification through faith alone apart from works. The contents of salvation by grace through faith alone in Christ Jesus rocket off the passage in Romans 3, 21 to 26. And so upon finishing that content, you might be thinking, great, that was awesome. That's the gospel. Now, what's, what's next? What will he now fold out for us next? But what Paul does next in verses 27 to 31 is actually something we as Christians need to observe carefully, and we need to model it closely as we bring the gospel to bear on the lives of sinners around us. Paul knows that while he's been laying out these very important, amazing, and even shocking and provocative contents of the gospel, he knows that his readers are already forming conclusions in their own mind about what he has said, about what he has written. 
And you need to be aware of that. You are not, as a gospel witness, as a gospel messenger, you're not just an information dumper. You need to be thinking about the conclusions that they're forming in their minds as they listen to you. As your children listen to you. Are you thinking about the conclusions that they're forming in their minds? Your, your spouse, perhaps, a, a coworker, a classmate, a friend. So yes, lay out the contents of the gospel. Do the very best that you can. And realize that as you are putting that glorious gospel content out there, that your hearer is forming conclusions in his or her own mind. And some of those conclusions are accurate, and many of them are not accurate conclusions at all. And so along the way, as you unfold how the gospel saves only through faith, by grace, it's important to stop and address the conclusions that exist in the mind of your hearer. And that is exactly what Paul is doing in Romans 3, 27 to 31. Now, you might not be as familiar with verses 27 to 31 as you are with the verses right in front of it or the chapter that follows after it, chapter 4, but it's so important because this passage tells us, it actually trains us on what proper conclusions we must draw at this point in the unfolding gospel argument. And so Paul provides three conclusions that must be drawn from justification through faith alone. Let me read the passage to you. Verse 27, where then is boasting? It is excluded. By what kind of law is it excluded? A law of works? No, but by a law of faith. For we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from works of law. Or is God the God of Jews only? Is he not the God of Gentiles also? Yes, of Gentiles also. Since indeed God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith is one. Do we then nullify law through faith? May it never be. On the contrary, we establish law. So here's what Paul is doing. Here's the setup. Here's the way we've been set up by Paul in the gospel. Since we all are the way that the gospel describes us in Romans 1 to 3, since we are all under the reign of sin, Romans 3, 9, since we are all under the wrath of God presently, even now, Romans 1, 18, verse 24, 26, and 28, since we are unrighteous in every way possible because we are filled with all unrighteousness, Romans 1, 29, since we are completely unable to separate ourselves from the rest of humanity under that horrible indictment, Romans 3, 22, there is no distinction. And since the gospel says the good news that God will freely give his very own righteous status to unrighteous sinners like that who will simply believe Jesus Christ, Since the gospel allows in no way at all any works of law or good works in that justification process or event, since all of that is indeed the case, there are three conclusions the gospel wants us to draw from a proper understanding of salvation. Romans 3, 27 to 31 provides three conclusions from a proper understanding of justification through faith alone. The first one. A proper understanding of justification through faith alone, number one, shuts out bragging in salvation. Verse 27, where then is boasting? If God saves unrighteous sinners, never in any way by their good works, but only through faith alone in Jesus Christ, well then, where is self-congratulation in salvation? Where is glorying or boasting in what I've done in salvation? Where is self-appreciation in salvation? Where is self-exaltation in salvation? Where is self-satisfaction in our own achievements in salvation? Where is bragging in salvation? The answer, 
it is excluded, meaning it is shut out completely. It is ruled out. No room for bragging is given at all in any way, shape, or form in salvation. And you know this from one of your favorite verses, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, right? For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not as a result of works, so that what? No one should boast. The gospel says that bragging in salvation has been shut out. It had the door slammed in its face by something. What? Verse 27. By what kind of law? A a law did it. But what kind of law? Well, we're going to find out how flexible this word law is, how versatile it is from one context to another. Let me just remind you a few verses back in verse 19 of chapter 3, the law there with the definite article in front of it is a reference to the Old Testament scriptures right above it that Paul mentioned in verses 10 to 18. And then in verse 21 of the same chapter, the law and the prophets revert to the same Old Testament scriptures. And then the word Law, with the definite article the in front of it, the law can also specifically mean Mosaic law that was given exclusively to the nation of Israel. And then law, without the definite article in front of it, can just mean a collection of rules or a system of of morals added to a life. So then what does the word law in verse 27 mean here? Well, let's look at how The gospel answers the question to help us form the right interpretation for law in verse 27. Bragging has been shut out by a kind of law. Was it, verse 27, a law of works that shut out bragging in salvation? The answer is no. But bragging in salvation was shut out by a law of faith. Maybe another way to say it would be, was bragging shut out by works law? The word work with an apostrophe S. Works law? Did that shut out bragging? No. Faith's law shut out bragging. Meaning, bragging wasn't shut out by good works way of approaching salvation. You see, works have a way of handling salvation. Works have a procedure. Works have a principle to follow regarding salvation. Works have a rule to align yourself with concerning salvation. The gospel says that if you follow the procedure of works or that method of works, that principle of works, that rule of works, or that law of works, bragging in salvation is not shut out. In fact, It works just the opposite. If you follow the rule of works, you will be able to boast in your false salvation, your anti-gospel salvation. It's no salvation at all. But the gospel abandons that law principle of works regarding salvation. The gospel has no interest in that rule or that method or that procedure of works because the gospel only allows God to be boasted in. In salvation. So the gospel excludes any way, any procedure, any method, any principle, any rule, any law of works in salvation. Instead, to ensure that no man brags in his salvation, the gospel puts forth faith's law or faith's rule in salvation, faith's principle. Faith's procedure, faith's method, I'm using a lot of synonyms, can you tell, regarding salvation. Work has its own twisted way of approaching salvation. Faith has its true way of approaching salvation. Faith has its own procedure, its own principle to follow for how salvation truly comes about. And the gospel says that when you follow faith's procedure, principle, rule, way, when you follow faith's law, bragging in salvation is once and for all 
ruled out. It has the door shut in its face. Verse 27, where then is boasting? Is, it is excluded. By what kind of law? Of works? No, but by a law or a principle of faith. Now, you may be thinking, why would Paul use this word law this way here? It, it seems only confusing to me and to you that he would use this word this way. But what's interesting is the hearers in Paul's day, especially the Jews, I think they would have gotten the irony. He put law really close to the word faith, didn't he? I think they would have gotten the irony. Unfortunately, so many of the Jews trusted in doing good works of law for their salvation. They fell for it. They fell for works way or procedure, or principle regarding salvation. But here, Paul is saying, if you're going to obsess with law, obsess with faith's law, faith's way of doing things, faith's rule regarding salvation. And Paul's explanation in verse 28 confirms this use of the word law in conjunction with faith. Faith's way, faith's procedure, or principle, or method, or rule for approaching salvation, it shuts out bragging because, verse 28, for we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from works of law. Remember what it means to be justified. To be justified means to be declared by God to be righteous in his own sight with his very own righteous status. Here's what it is not. Justification is not this. It is not God looking on what you're trying to do and validating your approach to right living, whatever you think it is. Justification is not validation of what you're doing. It's not like God looks on you with your law of what you're trying to do and he says, huh, I never really thought of doing it that way, but bless your heart, that's, well, no, he doesn't do that. There's only one standard of right that pleases God. There's only one standard of right that God accepts. There's only one standard of right that God blesses when he sees it. And there's only one standard of right that God gives. It's his own rightness, his own righteousness. Justification is being declared righteous by God with his very own righteousness. And that comes through an instrument, through a means, through faith, apart from works. We've talked about this, but faith in faith does not justify. Faith in the general idea of a supreme being or an intelligent designer does not justify. It must be faith in a man, the man, the God-man, Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus Christ, but even more specifically about him, it must be faith that embraces the bloody sacrificial death of Jesus that was the payment for our ransom, verse 24, and that satisfied the wrath of God against us, verse 25. Through or by that kind of faith in Jesus comes God's righteous status to the believer. And notice how important in verse 27 it is for the gospel to keep adding this negative statement to its positive statement about justification. This is apart from works of law, and there's no definite article there again, and so it just means any kind of law added to a life. God justifies a man by faith apart from any addition of a kind of moral set of rules to his life, any law-keeping. God works by, um, good works by any kind of law or set of moral rules is completely and entirely shut out of justification through faith alone. You see, that's faith's way. That's faith's way of approaching salvation. That's faith's law or rule, procedure method, principle for salvation. And that is what shuts out bragging in salvation. And, and you might say, really, I mean, is this really something 
uh, all, to be all that concerned about in me and in you. Um, turn back to Romans chapter 1, verse 30 for just a moment. And let me just remind you of, of what we are, what we were, apart from God in our lives. Remember in 128, um, just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, God gave them over to a depraved mind to do these things, those things which are not proper. And there's this really long list of these things that are not proper. And we, in our depraved mind, we do this. And I, and I want you to see in verse 30, three descriptions that are right next to each other that are, that are shocking. Verse 30, arrogant, boastful, inventors of evil. Oh, my goodness. Arrogant, boastful, <laughs> inventors of evil. That's what I am apart from God. That's what you are apart from God. And so when, if I am in that unrighteous condition, and I hear that God will save sinners by a means that doesn't include my effort, my works, my merit, what do I do as an arrogant, boastful inventor of evil? Hey, listen, either God means this or his word doesn't stand. What do I do as an arrogant, boastful inventor of evil then? Well, I invent another way for salvation for me. I invent an evil rule, an evil principle, an evil procedure for salvation that lets me then arrogantly boast in it. And that method or principle that I come up with, it has to include my works and my merit. And then, in arrogant boasting, as an inventor of evil, I approach God and I present my invention of evil before him, and I say, validate me. Validate me. See what this is. I've determined the method for salvation. I have this principle that I've been following. It involves law and my works. God, ignore your method, ignore your principle set out by faith, but pay attention to my method of works. Listen, that's arrogant, and that's boastful, and that's evil. It's evil. That's right. It's not a precious other way of kind of thinking about salvation. No, it's evil. It's an invention of evil, because it shakes a fist in the face of God who said in the gospel that salvation is by grace through faith alone without works. That's what he said. And to suggest that it could be another way is to shake a fist in his face and say, no, that's not precious. That's evil. The gospel's way of saving, faith's method Procedure, principle for saving completely shuts out bragging because God justifies a man by faith apart from works. So here's the honest truth this morning from me and for you. You are one of these two kinds of people. You are, you are either humbled. You, you are either emptied of self this morning. Emptied by the gospel you've learned to put a hand over your mouth to make sure that no self-congratulation might slip out in regards to your salvation. You are either that or you're still arrogant and boastful and coming up with other evil ways in which God might accept you, by which he'll pat you on the back and validate you. Have you believed Jesus Christ yet and therefore been emptied of you and emptied of all bragging and salvation? Or are you still this morning a little impressed with what you've got to offer? It's one or the other. A proper understanding of justification through faith alone, number one, shuts out bragging and salvation. Secondly, a proper understanding of justification through faith alone shows God's oneness 
towards salvation. It shows God's oneness towards salvation, verses 29 to 30. This is the second conclusion we must come to if we have a proper understanding of justification through faith. Paul says, or, in chapter 3, verse 29, meaning, if there was still any lingering doubt over what I just said, consider this, or, is God the God of Jews only? He is not the God of, is he not the God of Gentiles also? Yes, of Gentiles also. Now, what is Paul doing here? What is the gospel doing making this statement about the oneness of God at this point over Jews and Gentiles? I mean, isn't that kind of obvious to us that that there's only one God over both major divisions of humanity at that time in the world? You had Jews, the covenant people of God, and then you had the rest, the nations, the Gentiles. Isn't that obvious? What does that have to do with being a conclusion to draw from a proper understanding of justification through faith alone apart from works? What does that have to do with it? Well, Paul tells us what he means by this oneness of God in verse 29. Look at verse 30. Since indeed God, who will justify the circumcised by faith, that's the Jews, and the God who will justify the circumcised through, uncircumcised through faith, there's the Gentiles, that God is one. The one God has a special relationship with the Jews. There's no doubt about that, right? And those are the circumcised. That's the external sign of the covenant with Abraham's offspring, right? He justifies that segment of humanity just like he justifies the rest, the uncircumcised, by or through faith. And there's a change in prepositions there each time. You can see that in verse 30. Um, God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith is one. There's no significant point being made there. It's a similar way of saying the same thing. So what is the conclusion that we must come to because we have a proper understanding of justification through faith alone? Here's the point. If God is indeed one, a united whole being, a consistent God, not a spliced saver. Saver? Savior. That's what I meant to say. A spliced Savior. I'm functioning I have very little sleep these days. If that's the case, if God is united in oneness, then that one God will be consistent with his saving nature and his saving method, and he will not approach one group of humans with one method of salvation, but then approach a different group of humans with a different method of salvation. He doesn't have one method, one rule, one procedure, or one law of faith for one group, but then have a different method, rule, or procedure, or a law of works for another group. Approaching the Jews with one way regarding salvation, but then approaching the Gentiles with a different way of salvation, that betrays the unity of God, the consistency of God, the oneness of God. And the gospel's point, the gospel's conclusion that you must draw upon seeing justification through faith alone without works is that that, that justification That method of saving is actually an evidence of God's oneness. It's an expression of his unity as a savior. When you see a sinner believe Jesus, and you know or hear that the gospel declares that sinner righteous through faith alone, you should not conclude, well... That's how God is toward that guy, but that's not how God would be towards this guy. You understand? When you have a proper understanding of justification through faith alone, apart from works, you can conclude that God has made a statement about himself. He's made a statement about his oneness. He's made a statement about his unity, his consistency, or his predictability as a savior. In Paul's day, if you were a Jew, circumcised, with the external sign of the covenant that God made with Abraham, you still needed justification by faith alone apart from works. 
Or if you were a vile Gentile heathen in Paul's day, uncircumcised, and therefore you were outside the covenant of God that he made with Abraham and his offspring, what could you expect God to be like toward you in salvation? The exact same. He will predictably, consistently justify you by faith alone apart from works just like he does the Jew. Is God the God of Jews only or is he not the God of Gentiles also? Yes, of Gentiles also, since indeed God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith, he's one God. Maybe an illustration to help you think about this. Imagine a poor beggar boy in a kingdom. He lives in the alleys and he scrounges for food out of the garbage. But, but he sees that the rich, majestic king over him has believed Jesus. And he hears that the gospel says that, that 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 rich king is now declared to be righteous with God's very own righteousness. What should that poor beggar boy in a back alley conclude about how God would be towards him? Any different? No. Justification by faith alone proves God would be exactly the same toward that beggar boy or girl. Or maybe more importantly, an example like this. When someone who is a practicing Catholic or something like that, depending on their works in salvation along with faith. When that kind of person sees a, a prodigal, trust Jesus alone without any works at all, what should that practicing Catholic conclude about how God will be towards him? Oh, no, no, no. God will be different towards me, you see, because he'll see what I've done. No, you won't. Because God is not spliced in the way that he saves. God is one. And justification by faith alone, apart from works, is a display of his oneness as God. The one and only God has one and only one way of saving unrighteous sinners. He won't be different. Justification through faith alone, apart from works, that's his way of saving everybody. He doesn't have two different ways of saving. He is a united, consistent Savior. So if you understand this justification through faith alone, apart from works, and you hear a sinner testify that God has saved him by faith alone without works, you should not pridefully con con conclude, well, God will be different toward me. You see, he'll see my good works and he'll respond differently toward me in salvation because I've got some stuff to show him. God doesn't change his nature, and he doesn't change his way he saves from one sinner to the next. And you know what? You also can't conclude this, that if you hear how a, an unrighteous sinner has been saved through faith alone apart from any good works, you also can't conclude that God would never be that way towards you, that God would never be as gracious towards you that way because you know that you are far worse than that guy whom God saved by grace through faith. You can't conclude that I am so much more worse than him because I am. God wouldn't be gracious to me like that. Now, you should take comfort in this if that's the way that you think because the God who justified that, that first sinner by faith apart from works, he's one God. And he will be consistent. He will be unchanging. He will be unified toward you in grace if you believe Jesus Christ. So, a proper understanding of justification by faith alone secondly shows God's oneness towards salvation. Verses 29 and 30. Lastly, this morning, a proper understanding of justification through faith alone shores up law's stance in relation to salvation. 
It shores up law's stance in relation to salvation. Verse 31. The gospel asks a question at this point that needs to be addressed. After making the repeated staggering claim that that law has absolutely no place whatsoever in justification. Law has no place at all, and law keeping has no place at all in being declared righteous. Faith and law keeping don't go together in justification. Verse 31, do we then nullify law, and there's no definite article there, do we then nullify law through faith? I mean, think about what Paul has said here in verse 20. This is what the gospel says. By works of law, no flesh will be justified. Do you want to be uh, justified? Then then law and works won't be anywhere near that. Verse 21, now apart from law, righteousness of God has been manifested. So wherever there's law and works of law, uh, you won't find righteousness being declared. Look at verse 28, he just said it. We maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from works of law. So if faith and, or justification are that opposed to law or law-keeping in the salvation of sinners, does that mean that law is nullified through faith's presence in all ways? Is law rendered ineffective? That's what nullified means. Is law rendered ineffective? Is law abolished altogether? This is the use of law, again, without a definite article, the. Is there no place for a moral code in the life of believers in Jesus Christ? Because faith has nothing to do with keeping a moral code at justification? Does that mean there is no place for such a thing anywhere else in the life of the one saved by grace through faith alone? You see, one could listen to this gospel argument so far and in their minds be making a conclusion that, yep, law is gone. How does Paul answer this? He answers it emphatically in the strongest terms that he could say, may it never be. May it never be that law is nullified through faith. Rather, on the contrary, law or moral code or law keeping, it finds a place to stand. We establish law. It gets upheld, or as I've called it, it gets shored up in its proper place. When the gospel says that law has no place to stand in justification through faith alone apart from works, the gospel does not mean that law or law keeping will have no other place to stand in the Christian life. Now, Paul doesn't get into where and how right here in Romans chapter 3, but he wants to emphatically now deal with this wrong conclusion right here and establish the right conclusion concerning law's stance in relation to salvation. Perhaps we can state it this way. Upon hearing the amazing gospel of Jesus Christ, that God saves the unrighteous sinner by declaring him righteous through faith alone in Jesus. And that works of law, works of law, or obedience, has nothing to do with that justification. Upon hearing that, we should not conclude that being a Christian is a lawless life. We don't live a lawless life because law or law-keeping had no place in justification. As a believer, faith in Jesus Christ will not let you be lawless. But faith in Jesus Christ actually establishes a proper place for law to stand in your life. Obedience to law post-justification, after justification through faith, it needs very careful instruction from the gospel. And guess what? That is exactly where Paul is now going to start turning us in Romans. 
It's going to turn us slowly, and we're going to walk slowly, and we're going to walk carefully. Romans 4 will help us see how faith is the solid footing. At the, it's the bedrock of the life that obedience can stand on in a Christian's life. Romans 5 will open our eyes to see the powerful reign of God's grace in our lives through Jesus Christ. It is a grace that is so powerful that it can empower the believer to say no to sin and to say yes to obedience. That's Romans 6. You see, it's coming. And Paul's got that card in his hand, and he just said, see, I'm not laying it down yet, but I want you to see you can't make that conclusion. This is going to trump that. Do you remember how we talked about it when we were in Titus? in regards to God's grace. We talked about a doorway of salvation. At the doorway of salvation, what does the gospel say? What does grace say? No works here. You want to come across the the threshold of salvation, come in through the doorway of salvation, then uh, no works at all. No obedience, no law keeping here. He saved us not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, right? Right? But upon coming through that, by grace, through faith, when you then get on the path of progressive sanctification after the doorway of salvation, what does the very same grace say? You will be zealous for works. Titus 2.14. That's why Jesus died, so that we would become a unique people to him, a people zealous for good works, for good deeds. The last conclusion to come to, a a proper understanding of justification through faith alone, it it shores up law's stance in relation to salvation. It, It can't, law can't stand in justification, but it does have a place to stand. But we need to understand grace, and we need to understand the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit We need to understand what union with Christ means, united in his death, his burial, and united in his resurrection, and the implications on that for living a life of obedience. And Paul's not there yet, but he's tipping his hand in that direction. So, what conclusions have you been drawing from the gospel as you've heard it? Have you emptied yourself out in the gospel? Have you been emptied by the gospel where you don't want to brag on anything about you? That's good. It's a good place to be because you understand your sinfulness and you understand your inability to change what you are. You're prepared to turn to Jesus Christ by faith. Do you understand God is unchanging in his saving nature, and therefore he is unchanging in his saving method. He won't look on you and be a savior one way, but for other people, be a savior a different way. Do you understand that? He will not adjust himself away from grace and accept a method of works or law. And do you understand that We will not enter into the Christian life after justification through faith alone, apart from works. Do you understand that we won't be lawless? The grace that led you away from works, listen to this carefully, the grace of God that led you away from works at the doorway of salvation is the very same grace of God that will generate within you a zeal for good works in sanctification. You will not be lawless. And these are important conclusions for us to draw if we understand properly justification by faith alone apart from works. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word that you can guide us with it.
Father, we, we can't help but form conclusions about things that we hear and things that we read and the truths in your word that we uh, have presented to us that come across our own reading of your word. We, we, we form conclusions. And Lord, I pray that we would um, have an appropriate level of skepticism about our own conclusions, but that we would bring our conclusions to your word even more and allow your word to refine them. Lord, we don't want to come to wrong conclusions about what justification by faith alone apart from works means and is. So thank you for a passage even like the one we are in today that helps us, that can even train us, Lord, on how to think rightly about truth. Sharpen us, Lord, that we might be able to help others. Fine-tune our thinking and our listening as we shepherd our kids with the gospel, as we shepherd one another with the gospel, as we bring the gospel to bear on the lives of the lost around us, Lord. Help us to anticipate their conclusions and help us cling closely, tightly to your word so that we can help them affirm conclusions that are right and abandon conclusions that are wrong about the gospel. Thank you for your saving grace in our lives. Thank you for your sanctifying grace in our lives. It's in Jesus' name we pray.